the ball here. A little tip on a replacement player. Barkwell in the left hand corner of the hooker. Great work from Phil Mack. Great support from the team. And in the end, a simple finish for Barkwell from the Ontario Blues. And welcome to this pod of the Canadian Rock. I'm, I'm Jamie Gray coming out to you from uh, Rossley, New Brunswick. And as you guessed it from that little intro, we've got uh, Ray Barkwell on the line with us. We'll get to Ray's bio in a little bit. But uh, that little video clip you saw or listened to, I believe, was Ray's first try with Rugby Canada. As always, as we get started here, I'm always going to give you ways that you can contact us if need be. Uh, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and email. Our Twitter is at Canadian Rock. Our Instagram is the underscore Canadian underscore Rock. Facebook at the Canadian Rock. And if you need to get in contact via email, it's the Canadian Rock at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out. Uh, I love hearing from viewers, whether it's uh, on any of those platforms, it's always great. And uh, remember as well, when you're watching and listening on either YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or CastBox, that you need to follow and then subscribe. You need to like the shows. You need to share the shows. Get them out there. It's uh, It's been great having these great conversations with all these awesome Canadian rugby athletes, uh, as well as a few internationals. Um, it's nice to hear their stories. It's, it's amazing to hear their stories. And uh, I think... What I would ask is that when you hear these and you, you like them, like I'm, I'm assuming you do, is that you share them. You, you, you send them out to your, your buddies and your, your pals and uh, let, let other people hear these great words of advice or listen to the stories of how people, you know, became to uh, play national rugby for Canada. And the more that you can share that, the better it is for, I guess, everybody involved. And if you don't know where to go, the uh, the simplest place is the website, thecanadianrock.weebly.com. If you go there, all the pods are listed. Uh, YouTube links are there. The the Spotify links are there. there there's all kinds of things. There's, uh, there's a spot where you can take a look at our swag with hats and hoodies. And uh, we're out of stock right now, but I am definitely open to uh, ordering more if uh, there's enough interest. I'm looking at ordering coffee mugs right now, either for the house or the thermal travel ones. I haven't decided yet, but that is that is uh, being looked at at the moment. A uh, big shout out of the pod this week goes to uh, Jeffrey Young from Ontario. Jeff played uh, U15 for Team Ontario last week. He and I had a real cool conversation about the gray area. Uh, from last pod about law changes. Um, and Jeff came up with his, his big one that he was very adamant was just six subs in total per match. He didn't want it to get beyond that. He didn't like Eddie Jones' proposal of having six subs, but having a bench of 10 to choose from. He said, no, just six in total. Uh, really allows uh, and makes a coach focus more on strategy. He feels players will be fitter. Um, you know, instead of subbing out an entire front row, maybe you only have one front row sub. Um, he was really passionate that that would help the game. Really interesting thought. So thanks, Jeff, for uh, for bringing that out to our attention. And uh, good for you for uh, sending that in to get, uh, get a little shout out on the Canadian Rock. And thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. In rugby news, uh, there's some interesting things. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a couple. One is Six Nations, which is uh, has been has been finalized as to when that's going to start. It looks like uh, there are four games left on the Six Nations docket. First one's going to be Ireland hosting Ireland hosting Italy on October 24th, and then from there on October 31st, on Halloween, England will travel to Italy, Wales will host Scotland, and Ireland will travel to France. So all of that stated, that means Alan Wynn Jones is set to tie Richie McCaw with most international caps at 148 on Halloween night when Wales hosts Scotland. So that'll be uh, that'll be uh, you know an amazing uh, atmosphere for Alan Wynn, and uh, you know I'm sh I'm sure Richie will be watching somewhere as that record is tied. So that that'll be impressive. So October 24th is the first match. Then on Halloween will be the uh, will be the final three matches of the Six Nations, <clears throat> and uh, like other things, Rugby Canada is facing financial issues due to COVID like uh, any other business is. Um, same as many places. The men's, as you know, haven't played since the Rugby World Cup back in Japan. The women's haven't played. They've been idle since November. Uh, men's sevens were lucky enough to host that Vancouver event, and that uh, that generated a lot of revenue. But the women's in uh, series in Langford was shut down due to COVID. So all of that, there's a lot of financial issues going on with Rugby Canada. Uh, 
as it is anywhere around the world. Um, but there's a projection that uh, Rugby Canada won't be playing until 21. Naturally, that it uh, reduces revenue, but it also reduces expenses. So, you know, it evens out somewhat, but not very much. Um, there is a supposed fall test match versus USA, but that's all dependent on the border. Uh, the border's still closed, so if that border doesn't open, um, that uh, that match won't happen. Uh, Tim Powers, who's the Rugby, uh, Rugby Canada chairman, stated, all of this is out of our hands at the moment. It's governed by the quagmire of international borders, the free flow of COVID restrictions and domestically. So I can't give you a clear answer on any of that because we just don't have a clear path of what our activities would be, which would drive a lot of our spending. So saying that like the rest of the world, it's a waiting game. So we won't find out, um, I guess, if there's a going to be a fall test with the U.S., I guess we'll know when if if those border restrictions ease up a little bit. Um, as much as I'd love to see that, I'm not sure I feel confident with opening our border to the states at the moment, but uh, that is something beyond my pay scale. Our gray area of the week. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was chatting with Mark Wyatt last week and his pod will be coming up soon, but he mentioned back in 88, he was kind of a member of a world all-star team, so to speak, uh, that played Australia. And that was when Australia pretty dominant team, um, David Campisi and the likes. Uh, he said it was a really interesting event. So I uh, I got thinking that why why couldn't there be like maybe a Rugby World Cup All-Star versus the current Rugby World Cup champs? Very similar to a Lions tour. Maybe you choose the top 40 players in the world that were at the Rugby World Cup. So it could be a minimum of one per country or, or two per country. Uh, I mean, you could have one or two Canadians. You could have seven or eight or nine or ten New Zealand All Blacks. But you kind of got to make it a little more, I guess, equitable around uh, so that more players and more countries are involved. You play a three-match series with South Africa, and then you could play some South African super rugby teams. Um, this would happen, you know, maybe the year after World Cup or what have you. Mm -hmm. From there, the event itself made for TV, like how many people would line up and watch this, the documentaries you could make, you know, the Lions involves four teams plus the hosts. This would involve 19 teams plus the hosts. Uh, in person, holy geez, every stadium would be sold out, I imagine. Lots of revenue generated from all of this that could be shared amongst the 20 nations involved. Uh, what are your thoughts here? And, you know, the Lions tour, which is great, but as I said, it only generates revenue for England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and the host nation. And I love the Lions tour, but I think it's, uh, if you listen to previous pods, you know, without uh, <laughs> without beating this to death, um, it, it just, it, it, it leaves out so many other nations that want to play those top tiers. Like we were supposed to host England during the, during the Lions tour, but of course we're not going to get all their top players. We're basically playing a B side. All right, so I've mentioned that before. I've even mentioned what about America's tour where it's Canada, US, uh, Argentina, and Uruguay where we're kind of combined and we're going someplace similar to Alliance tour and doing that and generating uh, more interest in the game and more revenue as well. But what do you think of the All-Star squad? Like an All-Star series. I think there'll be a lot of pride on the line for that team that won the World Cup. So for South Africa, they're going to want to show that they can match up against anybody. Um, they're going to want to prove to the rest of the world that yeah, you bring us an all-star squad, we're going to be we're going to be on top of our game as the defending champs. As as for those that are selected to the Rugby World Cup all-star squad, it'd be the same thing. Like you're going in there, you're you know you're going in with a bunch of people that you don't know. Um, but I think it would be a really interesting event, really rugby centric, right? You've got that, that touring aspect, you've got uh, coming together with people from different backgrounds, the inclusivity of rugby. Um, but I guess my question, my, uh, the gray area aspect is not really a gray area. I'm throwing a question, who would you take from Canada that played at the Rugby World Cups Cup? So I want you to get, hit me up on, on Twitter or Instagram or email and uh, let me know or on Facebook and let me know who you think should go. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw up a poll on, uh, on Twitter and I'm going to throw up one on Instagram. And I'm going to nominate these uh, six names. See who uh, who votes back. But maybe you're going to go off the board. But I'm going to I'm going to throw up rare, uh, Cole Keith. I'm going to throw on Tyler Ardrum, DTH, Jeff Hassler, Phil Mack, Kyle Bailey. I'm going to throw those names up, and let's uh, let's see who you think should represent Canada. If something like an All Star versus the current World Rugby World Cup champs would actually take place, because uh, I think that would be 
it would be a pretty amazing event. Uh, like I said, something similar happened back in the eighties. Um, I'm not sure if it, it ended due to, um, due to the uh, professional game. Uh, I really don't know. I'd have to look into it a little bit more, but I think that would be really cool to watch. Uh, coming up next, uh, we've got Ray Barkwell and uh, Ray was an amazing guest, uh, just funny, uh, great storyteller. And uh, it was very interesting and uh, very fun to listen to Ray talk about his time playing rugby and where those travels took him. Uh, so as you know, long-standing hook for Team Canada, had 56 caps for Rugby Canada. He also played for Western Forces Super Rugby, which is, uh, which is really cool. Uh, he finished his career playing for Saddle of the Major League Rugby. He played in the 2015 Rugby World Cup. And, and right now he's currently completing his master's in uh, coaching at the University of Victoria. So Ray will be coming up shortly after this break. But first, we have our first sponsor of the Canadian Rec Podcast. So if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to get some really beautiful video to go along here. But uh, basically, if you like to fish, if you like to canoe, if you like to kayak, if you like to swim, how about all that while staying in a rustic cabins on a lake that is exclusively yours? You can enjoy that right now if you contact Island Lake Camps in northern New Brunswick. Call 356-5345 or 707-0273 to book. That's area code 506 for both of those. And uh, get your booking in now. All right. And uh, welcome back to the Canadian Ruck. Very fortunate today. We have uh, ex-hooker of Rugby Canada, Ray Barkwell. Uh, Ray's member of Team Canada for a number of years. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him on the podcast today. So, Ray, welcome to the Canadian Ruck. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, so let's jump right in here, Ray. So, born in Ontario, um, talk to us about how you became involved in rugby there, like the high school level, provincially, et cetera. Like, what was your pathway? What was your process? Uh, great question. One, I obviously, you know, a lot of people like to kind of know on, on your pathway. And uh, for me, it started in grade eight when I really got introduced it. I had a Kiwi geography teacher. And all it was was a little, you know, informed session on, on playing and this before flag rugby's you know kind of in schools um so that was my first kind of taste of it and then in high school my high school had a really really strong program uh, it had been kind of put in place for the you know maybe eight years prior and and so the coaching the 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 junior and senior teams were well established um you know i mean and, and there was a lot of coaches at that time i think each team had two quality coaches and and the senior team had, you know, 40 people and the junior team had 40 people. So, you know, I mean, there was competition. Everyone still made it. There wasn't a cut, but, you know, I mean, you were, you were fighting to get starting time. So it you know, started kind of within that high school. And then through my, you know, adolescent part of the high school experience, uh, one of my buddies said, why don't you come play for the club? I was like, I didn't know much about it. And then I kind of remembered we went to the club and played a game as a high school team once there. And our club owns its own field and, and, and facility. So we went out like on your Thursday or your Tuesday, whatever it was, and I, I kind of remembered the, the pitch and, the, and going into the clubhouse and the stink of beer and, um, you know, the used sock bin and all that kind of stuff. And, and getting that first experience to go run out with, with – grown men and uh and with a few of my good friends that are still good friends with so um that's kind of how it went uh my first you know touch of you know senior rugby I think and I was still in high school and playing you know high school rugby and playing some senior men's high school uh senior men's rugby in the spring through summer uh, and then I, I kind of like fell off a little bit. I, I didn't know what I was going to do within rugby or if I was just enjoying it because I, I did play a lot of other sports and really focused on baseball at that time. And, uh, and then the Super League kind of flamed up a little more in my region, and that's when the inclusion of the Thunder Rugby, uh, Niagara Thunder Rugby team was, was brought into the Super League. And so I just said, oh, look, I'm going to try out for this. I think I can do it. And, and I'll never forget because I put in the work and I was in the gym lifting, getting fit, playing as much rugby as I could again, um, and then did the tryout and, and kind of made the extended squad side and played a little bit, nothing much. And it kind of was like that for the next couple of years. I, you know, I'd get in a game or two, but a lot off the bench for 10, 15 minutes and 
having, you know, some good players in front of you. But I just kept enjoying that. And then, you know, that league, we had a successful team. We went on to the finals one year. And, and that year I actually played a role on the team more than just kind of a supplementary kind of role. And then it kind of formed into that blues. And that's where, you know, when I was in university, I went back after trade school, was playing at Brock and then getting better and, and then applying that to the blues program and really kind of trying to put my flag up. And, and it was tough because I had uh, Mike Pletch in front of me, who was a good established player. And you know, I mean, I think could have been the, you know, hit between him and his brother, one of the leaders and captains within our group. So it was tough. And, and then that's the, basically the start before I really started, you know, pushing where I could take it. And, uh, I just didn't wasn't getting the time with the Blues at that moment, uh, so I said, "Look, I got to keep my education going." I went and did my teachers' college in Australia, and took a good opportunity down there at a school who was helping me out with some financials and housing and flights and playing for the club. And you know, it's all about connections sometimes in rugby. And the, and one of the students was a, a colleague at the university, my undergrad, kind of like probably built me up for more than I was. Um, and, and caught me some assistance, which was huge to ma making that decision. And, and that decision got me onto the club, but also got me into that NRC side within Perth. And then before I know it, within two years, I was getting uh, invited to go uh, to the Western Force and, and, and get an opportunity in professional rugby. That's pretty awesome. So it quickly like, turned around. <laughs> where I was just going to have enjoyment and save myself some money and, and have a, a good experience. And before I know it, I was, you know, playing rugby at an obviously a very high level. So that must have, that must have been an amazing feeling. Like you leave Ontario, you're not getting much playing time with the Blues, head to Australia for university, and all of a sudden you're playing for Western Force. Like, what is your mindset when that happens? Like, what is your thought process? I think, you know, like, I was a fan before I was a, a player. So, I mean, I, I would be, be lying to say I didn't get excited. I mean, I literally thought I'm just going to get some swag and <laughs> I'm nice. like I'm, I'm 29 years old. I, I, I'll take what I can get. And, and, you know, I mean, when you, when you walk out and you're in the sheds uh, with like legends, um, it, it, it's it's a humbling experience. It's an exciting experience. It's one I'll never forget. And, and you know, Ben McCallum and, and Nathan Charles and, um, I mean, who else is a, a really good uh, – like David Pocock was there, James O'Connor. And, it, like, the, like, the amount of, like, really good players. But the great thing I really take away from it, um, Nathan Sharp too, like, was the inclusion. Like you just made you felt like you're a part of the team, and when you're the you're the you know the odd one out. I mean the Canadian guy within a group of you know Australians, South Africans, Kiwis, and, and other Polynesian groups. I'm the I'm the you know the the fly in the milk kind of thing, and they're looking at you like, I mean your accent to you know I mean, the way you play, and, but it, I just never felt so um, accepted. And, and that excited me. And, um, like, some of those conversations kind of fueled me to keep working hard. And, and I was, you know, like, getting great coaching. And, and a lot of that comes to, like, my buddy helping me. And um, at the same time, the coach played rugby for a summer in, in Canada and was good friends with Mike James. So his little connection to Canada really kind of got me the opportunity. So it kind of comes full circle a little bit. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That's a that's a neat little story to to kind of get you playing pro and then, then playing nationally. Um, that's really awesome. Uh, let, so let's let's uh, let's look at it a different line here. So Ontario, one of the best rugby provinces in Canada, right up there with British Columbia. Now uh, Ontario's had its fair share of national athletes. Rest of the provinces, you know maybe not as might be hit or miss what do you think the rest of Canada can do to try and catch up so to continue to strengthen rugby Canada kind of get RC back in that top 15 you know level of, of world rugby 
especially now with COVID, like my old club coach stopped in tonight for a beer and, and my rugby nickname's Moon. He goes, Moon, like, I, I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to keep these guys engaged. I'm not sure what to do. What are your thoughts? Like, what, what can we do? I, I think that's, you know, I, if you had a, a, a guaranteed answer, you'd be a wealthy person or you know, <laughs> one that looked and be revered to by rugby fans across Canada. Very complex. Um, think lots of people are trying it. I mean, it's an opinion. My opinion is enjoyment. Uh, you have to, you have to uh, look at enjoyment. And you know, I mean, my philosophy um, on how I want to play and how I want to coach, it has to, it has to infuse that into everything. Um, especially in the, exp you know, exploring that sport as new. And because you're going to ask kids to come from different sports to try a new sport. And, I mean, funny enough, I'm doing a project on specialization and the issues within it and what positives and negatives happen and, and how specialization has a, a good um, outcome when uh, achieving it at the right time. And so... I think, you know, I mean, for rugby in Canada, you have to go and try to, you know, get it into the flag part and the age grade and introduce people to maybe get a portion of that group. But, you know, the hard thing from being a teacher and doing it is that you have to create the conversation in the school. And, you know, I mean, things I do is, is that I do it in a positive way, but positive always doesn't work. Um, and just being like pulling and come and come out, you have fun. I try to tell them my experiences. Uh, I try to explain that you can travel the world. I can, uh, you know, I mean, not everyone's going to, no one's going to arguably maybe come from my school and play for Canada, but I, I'm not, that's the outcome base. So I'm looking at participation. Yeah. And in, in that part, if you can get participation, that's the first I mean, foundation. And so I look at that as being the biggest part is getting that in schools and, and creating that keeping financial um, constraints minimal. Um, another one. Insurance um, is a hard one. Heart insurance is a tough one in Canada, if not North America. Yeah. Uh, a very frustrating one uh, too. Um, so doing your best uh, to, to help minimize that. Um, I'm not a big sponsor of a team. I'm, I'm a big sponsor and athlete, um, especially when, you know, demographics change socially uh some athletes don't need assistance um parents do well and they can pay some athletes might need a little assistance so you know maybe putting your name on a jersey sometimes is a good thing and helps with the cost but maybe like instead of donating the program you donate to one athlete to help lower the cost for them maybe on a rep team so that's a that's an angle i think is, is better for people who want to donate and they don't know what to donate or they want to quietly donate yeah. Um, but you know, inclusion and, 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 and keeping it fun is the, is the first thing. And then, you know, talent ID, we go look across our cat, our country. It's a very frustrating and you have to kind of do some statistical, you know, analysis of it. Ontario has the most population, probably argue the most rugby clubs. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to assume, uh, BC being second, um, and so when you look at, you know, the spatial, you know, alignment linearly towards, you know, how many people play and, and succeed in those provinces. And this is one I just talked about the other day. Our sevens team has 16 players from BC, right? Mm -hmm. We have five, I think, from Ontario and then a mixed bag, one and offs. And now they're very good rugby players and they all well deserve to be at that stage. But you can't tell me percentage wise, why we don't have more sevens players coming out of Ontario. We, we just, the resources aren't there to look and maybe talent ID these things. And that's the one thing I look at. And then when you see the balance within a 15s team, it's probably balanced a little more, you know, I mean, you know, towards across the country and membership, but there's an outlier. And in Quebec, how the population of Quebec and, and still has a great rugby culture why are we getting the numbers of kids coming out of that province? Yeah. And, and that's, that's something that, you know, some kind of form of like research needs to be done on what is going wrong from a men's point. Cause the women's point's not a problem. Yeah. They're dominating. 
they're dominating their top between Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and then you see the decline in BC from the women's point. So there's some things to be done and looked at from a provincial and interprovincial unions, but also looking at national pathway and how we go about doing it. And, you know, specialization and picking kids is not an exact science when I went previously talking about that. Yeah. Um, can't look at me as how I got there because I think I'm an outlier. But if we have strong leagues and kids who are really excited and with Major League Rugby, we can look at kids at 20, not 18 as you know, properly identified. Yeah. You have to be able to have to paint broader pictures. And, and yes, we have to have a pathway that we guide a, a good percentage of our younger athletes towards what we think success can be for them for that. You know, kids are still growing between that 18 and, 20, 18 and 21 age. I coached provincially here for the last couple of years in New Brunswick, and I'm not anymore. But one of the things that I pushed is that it's just it's so expensive for you know New Brunswick or Nova Scotia for us to try and for for me to take my team to Prince Edward Island, which is a three hour drive to Charlottetown. It costs the kids almost five hundred dollars for a weekend tournament, and to me that's that's not acceptable. And then you look at going to Kingston for a week for Easter Nationals. It was costing the kids between around fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, it's the same for Ontario when they're coming east, but my thought was, why can't we thin this out a bit? We'll maybe have an Atlantic division, a Quebec, Ontario division, and then maybe, you know, or even have it so there's tiers, like a tier one under 18, a tier two one under 18, where, you know, Team New Brunswick's not getting slaughtered by the Ontario teams or whatnot, but nobody, you know, that was always falling on deaf ears. No, I think those are, are valid points. I think Ontario's taken the structure of that because it's a big province geographically and they're yeah. taking it more in a regional perspective and, and, and playing more rugby is what is needed. So if you have, if, if, if to play more rugby, there's a hurdle, we have an issue. If to play more rugby, there's a, geog geog a geographical issue, there's a hurdle. If to play more rugby, you know, is our, our basis, we got to figure out a solution and it, and it tends to be interprovincial and playing more teams, more jamborees, uh, looking at reductions. The one thing I think we get away from is the fundraising aspect of things. And the one thing I think I believe and I made sure of my rugby group at my high school is that they have a huge participation in it because the value of working together to get $200 or $10,000 from a bottle drive, from a fundraiser sale, whatever it may be, a beer and a burger, um, to gold coin donation at the rugby club when you park and letting them know it goes to, the, to their high school team are fun ways to, to create you know, that culture within a team. I know that's from my experience as the, doing car washes every other Saturday at the parking lot in our high school where you got, you know, 35, 40, you know, boys that were, you know, washing cars and, and charging, I think we were charging, like it might date me, like three, five dollars or something like <laughs> to do a car. Or it was like, hey, get your car washed, give in what you want. I think it yeah. could have been that too. So, but like that made us a, a better group of people. And in what what ended up happening is like we all went and played football together and then we were on basketball and hockey together and then we played rugby together yeah. and that's we we there but there was success while we won football basketball and and um rugby all three sports and all the same year we just had continuity and that gets in a little bit more of like how your teams can be successful yeah. it's a little deeper but it also like made us a part of them. We felt, you know, accomplished. We, 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 we started wanting to be there because we were just shooting the shit, hanging out with our buddies. Yeah. It's, you're, you're more invested, but you hit on a few things there. You talked about the specialization. You just talked about yourself playing three or four different sports. You, without, I mean, going into it too much, because I'm just throwing this as an aside question, what do you find as an important attribute of being a multi-sport athlete? That's one of the things I struggle with at my school. I teach at a, a private or an independent school. You know, you have kids coming in for hockey, you have kids coming in for basketball, kids coming in for soccer. And sometimes, you know, there's subtle gestures from people saying, no, don't play rugby. Yeah. Uh, or to, or to I mean, gym instead. And yeah, I, I, I mean, 
don't even get me on the gym thing. Um, it's, it's a, you know, yeah, that's, that's a supplementary thing that you need later on. Um, I think, I think, you know, you're right. And, and in my school, lacrosse is enormous and it's, you know, I mean, growing up in the lacrosse community at home and living in one now, and our school has 11 kids who got scholarship to, to D1, D2 schools this year. And sometimes the experiences in different sport, actually, the one thing I try to sell these kids on is like, come play rugby. I'm going to work on your footwork and your, and your physicality. And that is going to make you a better lacrosse player. And I'll tell you why. Because I look at the way you do things and I'm like, ooh, that's really, you got something here that will and I think if you do it and apply it to my sport, it's actually going to make you better. It also gives you like an escape of the of the specialization within your sport. And when you come back to your sport that you really do love and say lacrosse is it, and, which is great, you come back invigorated, wanting to learn and you, your experiences make you better. If you think for a flying minute, oh, I got better from tackling because of rugby solely, then you'd be lost. Like obviously football played a factor into it. You think catching a ball Practicing catching a rugby all was how I got good at catching. No, I played baseball. Being creative in basketball let me to learn to be creative in, in rugby. My soccer aspect, there's a reason why I feel like I can kick a ball and it doesn't look weird because I played <laughs> soccer. And, you know, as much as that, that's supposed to be never brought out, it tends to happen for me And when I played rugby is me putting my foot uh, – on the ball and putting a little toe on it. So, I mean, but like there's scenarios that happen in other sports that make you think of things around the back pass didn't come from me trying to rugby. It came from basketball, it came from baseball. You know what I mean? Yep. As much as those things might not be applied, there may be a learning that you don't know that helps you learn not do it in rugby. It's funny that you say, uh, I say that because one of my, one of my kids last year, uh, Tall kid from Newfoundland. He's on our basketball team. He's probably six two, six three, and he's, he's a string bean. Um, and he was in our school in grade nine and ten, and was scared to play rugby. He came out in grade eleven, and we never lost a line out. And he scored three or four tries. And I think it was about the fourth game. He came up to me at half and said, "Coach, I'm really still struggling with the second row thing. What do I do?" And I said, "You know," and I just gave him like thirty seconds advice. Opening kickoff of the second half, he caught it and burned through the entire team and scored. And he runs by me and goes, I think I understand that. <laughs> but he, the, there wasn't rugby this season, uh, but he got a, he got a, scholar, or, you know, a scholarship to a school in Nova Scotia to play basketball. And uh, he came up to me and goes, he said, I was going to play this year, even though the coach said no. But he said, rugby may be a better basketball player because he said, I toughened up. My footwork is better. My, my precision on my passing is better. And I said, tell your teammates, because, you know, I want them for next year or whatever, right? So, little thing. Yeah, I think that's a great example. I mean, like, for basketball players, like, I'm sick. Uh, like, and I love basketball and, and coach it at the school. Is like <laughs> this worry about being injured or this worried about, you know, being sore, tired. Yeah. And, and, and then the things that the, that young man learned is, like, how to be physical when you're 6'5 down the post. You know what I mean? Um, I wish my cousin, I had his cousin that was seven foot. I think rugby would have done him heaps better. And he he, he got an opportunity at, at the NBA. Wow. I think him playing, like, he specialized so quickly because he was six foot eight when he walked in in grade nine. Jeez. You know what I mean? His, his, his family is that big. I got the, obviously I had to take the short gene on our family. Um, and he got the big one. But, you know I mean, he had... I mean, I'll never forget watching him when I was in grade 12 and he was in grade nine, watching him, you know, do well. And, you know, by the time I graduated, he was still in, you know, Coach Beheim and, and Coach K coming and watch him and, and being like, like basketball was destined for him, but he yeah. could have gotten better at playing rugby, being physical, because that was something he lacked at in the post of being a seven yeah. footer. And it wasn't, his, it wasn't string bean. He was just not, didn't have that that little bit of um, of sandpaper to him. Yeah. So uh, you started to touch on. You said I don't want to get into it. what's what you're. I said about the gym, going to the gym, and you kind of scoffed and said, "Don't get me going on the gym." Did I did I mishear that or? No, no. I think I mean the gym's important. It's the timing of when the gym's important. Yeah. So like 
last year I was coaching U18s and, and I get forwards and to keep accountability, you know, send me what you're doing, video things you're doing. So for the hookers, I want, I want to see videos, you know, side and, and rear view and, and even, you know, front of, of your throwing. So I can look at things I'm seeing you do right and wrong and where we need to fix and build and put time in and, and, and ask questions and, and, and want them to be open to dialogue. But what do you think is the first thing I open up every time? Uh, them working out. Yeah, some massive squat, which is great. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, yes, it's it, it's going to make us better. Is it in in our categories, the top three? Not a chance. Because strong people in sport doesn't really, you know, constitute you being strong in the gym. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's just... This, it's so skilled based and there's so much to know and learn and decision making that playing is is the first thing. Developing your skills is second. And arguably I, I could put fitness in front of all those. Fitness is the next thing. The first thing I ask kids, I don't care about your S and C. I'm not the S and C coach. <laughs> I I worry about skills and I have to worry about fitness. So when big front rowers come to me and, and sevens and, and guys who want to learn how to get over the ball, um, said, show me your Bronco, videotape it, and throw the clock on it. Yeah. And let me see how fit you are. Because great, you can push things and you're strong. But when you're blowing out your ass, you ain't going to be able to do that. Yeah. And so I, I, I focus like, show me your skills, show me your fitness test. I don't care about the gym. When you get 20 – you're in the national program or you're at a university, they'll work on that. I let yeah. those people do their job and do that. Fitness has to have a correlation to me understanding how fit you are going to be to be able to perform a decision and make a, a skill successful. Are you, are you able to make that decision at the 75th minute when you're making it at the fifth minute? Like, are you, Well, that's it, right? Do you have uh, that awareness when you're gassed? Exactly. Can you pull yourself off the ground yeah. when you're blowing and you're sucking donkey water, right? Yeah. Uh, those are questions I want to see. And, and I, that kind of even goes into like kids sending tape. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to see the good things and I'm going to see the good things you don't even know is good. Yeah. And so do I care about just a highlight video? I want to see a video from start to end of a whole match, looking at the things that you need to work on and put focus on the things that you do well that you might not know. But if you just show me ball carries when you run through a turnstile and a kid who doesn't want to tackle, you did your thing right, but it doesn't give me a really good objective thing to kind of critique. So yeah, those are the other things. That's yeah, I, I couldn't agree anymore. Right? Uh, let's switch it up a little bit here. So, 2015 Rugby World Cup in England, uh, birthplace of rugby. Talk to us about your experience going there with Canada in that environment. Oh, yeah, I mean, be lying if it wasn't a dream come true. I think I never, you know, my goal in life was to play for Canada. I never even talked about playing at a World Cup. Um, I mean, playing for Canada, I still, I wrote it in my yearbook as a kid when I was in high school. Um, I, I think it was, you know, I mean, to accomplish something so big um, for a rugby player, don't matter where you're from, what country, um, I mean, is it's such a you know a testament to maybe timing and opportunity and, and working hard and success and sacrifice and all those cliches. But um, for me, it meant I mean the world to me. And and so knowing when we qualified, uh, 2014 or 13, whatever it was, um, that we qualified. That I that's when I evaluated my process on what I have to do to not just be there. I. I I wanted to play every game. I wanted to start every game. I wanted to play every minute of every game. I wanted to be the best I could be, and I wanted to let everyone know I could, I could be the best and, and, and make people ask questions um, when we played against them. Um, and so that, like, I'm a big goal-setting goal person, and that was something I wrote down. We had these journals with our – we had a sports psych guy, and I just kind of really bought in a little bit more than – I mean, the old school way of learning it. And I try to take every resource and apply it to how I was going to perform. 
And so when I reflect after the tournament, um, I was, I was over the moon, um, feeling like I actually performed the best rugby I've ever played and did it at the world stage and at the highest of the world stages. So that was my individual goal. And, you know, at the end, the only part is it's very disappointing because we didn't, you know, get any of the the team goals. And those are important too, because, uh, I always say this to kids, you know, I steal Herman Edwards, you play the game to win. Um, I don't, I don't play for second. No one, you know, I mean, no one gives a shit about anything other than winning. Um, and when you're at that level, um, I'd probably give up a lot of the accolades um, to win one game, not only two that we should have won. Yeah. And they haunt you, and, and they're the things that everyone has to ask. And I mean, I've been on successful teams. I've been on some of the worst teams and losing. And I remember the losing more than I remember the winning. It sounds like a coach right there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, England, I mean, every country does World Cup amazing. I've been to New Zealand, I've been to England, I've been to Japan. Yeah. They all knock it out of the park. Um, language barrier is a little tough sometimes but <laughs> but everyone loves rugby so much you you can't tell the difference yeah yeah especially in england where it's such a such a cultural effect there with uh, the birthplace of rugby and yeah. then having england not qualified for the for the quarters and it's just it was, uh, it was an amazing event play play in fiji you want to see love for rugby play in fiji yeah. it's yeah. mental like yeah. it, i mean the guys who've been there the experiences and the stories you can tell. I mean, we're from Canada. Um, and my first experience in Fiji was even with Canada and I had a rugby shirt on and they knew I was Canadian because they asked me who I was from and they wouldn't shut up about Dave Moonlight. <laughs> I mean, and um, he's in my, in my master's program right now. And I don't think anyone in our program really knows how good Dave was. And, and is, that, how, is that John's, John's cousin or? John's cousin and yeah and uh and so like he's revered in sevens rugby he's well known in sevens rugby and and yeah. when when Fiji gets your approval in sevens rugby you've done something well and that's awesome he, he would never tell you those things he's so humble by the experience <laughs> and John talked him up quite a bit uh, when I chatted with him and uh, it was pretty interesting to hear John's take because they're related and and uh, just how much of an impact he had on John's career. So that's really cool that in Fiji, they're, you know, they're tooting his horn the same as, as John's cousin was. So that's really yeah. nice to hear. All right, so we're going to switch gears. We're going to do our quick fire section right now. So we've got about 20 questions. And Ray, these are kind of geared. The first half are about uh, playing, and the second half are kind of more about you as a person, just to have a little bit of fun. Yep. Don't put a whole lot of thought into it, but just have some fun with it. Fire away. All right, first one, best team you have ever faced? Um, <laughs> Ireland. When was that? Uh, I'm going to say 2016. Like, we, we're, we, sometimes we don't play the uh, – sorry, 2015 World Cup. Like, yeah. Just the things they were doing, they were, they were outstanding. Yeah, they're always pretty good. Best player you ever faced? Haka Elliott. Toughest player you ever faced. Usually when I when I explain this one, it's it's a one v one. They have the ball. And who is it that you're looking at like, oh shit, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to stick my head in there. Uh too long. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah, I would wonder why. Yeah. All right. Player that you loved to smash. Oh, uh, the 10 from Romania. He's a prick. <laughs> All right. Uh, best match you were ever a part of? Oh, um, Scotland when we lost. Scots are always a fun match. Favorite rugby tradition? Um, <laughs> I can see the gears going right there. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I, I think... Uh, Drinking beers after the game with the team in the sheds. 
Yeah. I think, I think that's probably one of the ones that people don't really know at the highest level it still happens. Yeah. That's uh, that's, uh, that's one of my favorite things too. Best team you ever played with. Um, yeah, I definitely, the blues. Um, I want to say like 2014, 13, like, I mean, when you, because the different levels and all that, but like, just, I think we ran off like 19 games of winning in a row. Jeez. Um, fun, enjoyable, all that. Uh, That's and awesome. Nice. Uh, your nickname? <laughs> Flama Blanca. <laughs> Best nickname that you've heard? <laughs> Roadkill? Is that the story later? Road, road kills it. Uh, there's a land shark and there's a shit stain there too. <laughs> yeah, they all got wild stories. Nasty. All right. Any rugby superstitions? Um, I used to uh, when I was younger. I, um, but I, I would say the one I stick with, I don't eat. I eat breakfast on a three o'clock kickoff and that's it. And I'm pretty – like that's something I, I kind of stick to. Um, is, is how much I eat. Is that a superstition or is that more like just? It's between the men, like mental, physiology. but like, like, yeah, the physiology, like I can't stand being full. Yeah. I have to pick and eat just to kind of keep me, you know, satisfied. Not, I can, I can't handle it. It, it messes with me mentally as much as it does physically. Have you watched the, uh, last night or sorry, the last dance documentary, the Jordan documentary on Netflix? Yeah. All right, tell me who your Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman are that you've played with. In, in, in the athleticism or the context of being a dick? Entirely up to you. Yeah. Um, best player on, on our field, um, I definitely can say, like, I, I think DTH is, is just, I mean, like, we bug him because he doesn't train sometimes, but he shows up on game day. And, and that's something that um, I admire because he's very consistent. Um, most like guys who, um, you know, like Pippi who, who support that guy so much, I think people don't give Gordy McRory enough credit. He's a good player. Uh, he's a very good player. He re reads the game well, and, you know, maybe we don't do enough for him. Um, and sorry, the last one is Rodman. That's Jamie Cudmore. Um, uh, he's the guy who sticks out because he's always a little bigger, he's uglier than anyone else. And I mean, people know him, and he can he he does great things on the field. And then there's times where we always had to go, Oh, shit. he's in the bin again. Um, so you know, I mean, but, but he could he could physically change a game too. Was, he, was it 2015 against France when he jumped into their lineup to listen to what was going on? Yeah, and I think those are like funny things you learn about your teammates and the characters. And I mean, I think only he could do it. I think if yeah. I do it, I'm, I'm probably ten rows, up, I'm 10 rows up in the stands. Uh, I, I chatted with him last week, and I don't remember who his Robin was, but it wasn't you. So <laughs> That's a good thing. Any three to take golfing, alive or dead? Oh, my golfing group. Phil Mack, we always have a good time golfing. We golf a lot more on tours. Nick Blevins, um, we golf always, a lot on tour. Uh, he always reminded me of like a, whenever I watched him on TV, like he's got that stash. I always thought he was like a cop. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, he, he's got a good stash. So I'll get yeah. That. yeah. Um, you know what? I'd take uh, Cole Keith because you need a left-hander out there. And Somebody we, need, fun we need someone to talk shit about the whole That's time. Right. So. That's right. I don't know how many times he's texted. He goes, I'm in your area. I was going to come for a beer, but uh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, fair enough. Yeah. All right. Chips or cookies? Oh, chips all day long. What kind? Okay, it don't matter, except no salt and vinegar. Salt and vinegar, nice. French fries or onion rings? Uh, French fries. They got to come from the rink, though. Oh, yeah. Rink fries. Rink or fries. fries. All right, what about plain fries or poutine? Poutine. Nice. Favorite beer? Oh, I mean, I'm cheap. Like, <laughs> I'm, I, I drink anything. <laughs> I drink Lucky out here. I drink, I drink oh. the cheap stuff, man. Um, 
I, I drink the one thing I do say I, I drink the local um, nice. yeah I, I stick to what pours well so you know in Ireland if you drink Guinness if I'm out east I'll drink Moosehead if, uh, if I'm not drinking Keith's when I'm in Ontario drink Sleeman's or I drink OV because it still pours well there I like uh, Ontario I like steam whistle from Ontario yeah, that's, I mean that's a Toronto. I don't, I don't, I don't deal with the, that group. I won't go up in that high level of beer quality. Sorry. OVs, my small community, and still pours well, and it's still a dollar a draft. Nice. Well, I know the CEO of Moosehead Breweries. I coached his son, so if you're out here, <laughs> I used to drink a lot of that when I was in university. Nice. Uh, what's a guilty pleasure? Um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I, I probably, probably have a, an, an ice cream more than I should. That's what, that's what Hassler said too. Yeah. <laughs> what kind? Does it matter? Uh, mint chocolate chip all day long or cookies <laughs> and cream. Nice. Uh, best place for a post-match beer. I think you're going to say in the sheds, but maybe not. Uh, yeah, like I think, I think you like it there, but like, to be honest, uh, I like I like a, a greasy pub. Um, I like a dark one. I like yeah. being in the back corner. I, I mean, I'm have. married, so I'm not like the young guys who want to go throw <laughs> shapes at the dance club in Brazil. <laughs> All right, what series are you binge watching right now? Um, what have I just worked on? I'm trying to remember. Oh, I, I um, Ozarks. I, I didn't yeah, binge yeah. watch, but I was I was like obsessed with that, so I, I had to finish that one. Nice, um, nice. But I do watch reruns of The Office a lot. <laughs> you, and, uh, you and my 23-year-old son could hang out. That's all he watches that. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, Days and Confused. Nice. But uh, sports is another level. I would say Major League or Slapshot or even... Oh, too classic. Like, I mean, it, like... It all did. There's context. I, and I'm a movie buff and I'm, I love one-liners. And I mean, when it comes to sports, we, we educate the young group because we make sure we put on Bull Durham and all these nice. great legendary sports movies and well, crickets, lots of crickets. <laughs> um, but I, I, I make sure I said that, you know, like you have to watch, you know, right of passage. Yeah. But even like Tim Cup and, well, yeah. they're, it's, they're, they're filled with sports psychology stuff too, right? Yeah, I know. Like, And I, the good thing is our older group really kind of tries to instill some of these things, or we, at least we tried yeah. to do. And, and, and we make our foreign coaches watch Slapshot. Um, <laughs> wouldn't, have a, wouldn't have a clue what's going on, I imagine. <laughs> but I, honestly, the, the Kiwis loved it. Um, they, yeah. were, they thought it was great. I think our comedy kind of falls in the line. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Who would play you in a Netflix movie of your life? Someone's going to say something stupid, like from Lord of the Rings, but. Um, <laughs> You're not that short, are you? Oh, you'd be surprised. Um, uh, do, 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 what's that guy? Um, <laughs> oh, shit. Um, Parks and Rec guy. Um, Jason Bateman? Um, no, the guy with the, the mustache who's a little. <laughs> Uh, who does the bacon is like bacon. oh veggie bacon and he just yeah, puts it yeah. I can't remember his name I, I can't either <laughs> fair I'm enough I kind of dry like that guy I think at times right. so all right who would play the leading lady oh, Jesus she's around so um is she gonna listen <laughs> possibly yeah <laughs> um I, d I will tell you a couple Connor Trainer and a couple other guys wouldn't answer this because they were a little <laughs> You know, I, I, I gotta like. I have to pick someone who's athletic and, and beautiful. So, um, uh, I I don't know. It's I, your it's your movie. It doesn't have to be an actress. It could be a singer. Um, Jamie Cudmore chose Giselle Blundishan. Oh yeah, that'd be that be a, that's not a bad one. But I can't go there. I uh, you know <laughs> what? Um, Sleem Hayek. I'm not sure. Selma Hayek. Selma Hayek, sorry, did I say Selma yeah, yeah. well, um, yeah. yeah, She's one of my favorites. All day. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, she's got the look of my wife, even though she's got a little more Spanish than my wife has none. <laughs> all right, last one. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? 
Um, I, oh, it, it's a conversation I had with my high school coach um, who, I mean, he, he was the guy who went to my elementary school and was a legend. You know I mean? As crazy as that thinks. And he was a legend at my high school and he's a legend at his university and he's a legend in, in coaching football. And, and his name is Billy Brown. And um, to be honest, we went on a tour to Ottawa and, and he asked me what I, you know, what he saw, what the difference between football and rugby was. And I couldn't answer it. And, and, and then he kind of just deliberated it and, and then it kind of, kind of clicked and why I wanted to continue to play it. So, I mean, it had a really big influence on being a team and working hard and all those, you know, things that coaches bring and teach you and, he, he really kind of instilled love to the game and how much, how important it was. And it's crazy. He still loves rugby and is important. Uh, it's so important to him as much as he doesn't do it. Um, and, and his father's Scottish and he grew up loving rugby, but he really had the biggest influence on, on maybe me taking the, the right, not the left turn. Nice. All right. So we, we get a, thanks for those. We got a, we got a few left on our, for the regular questions. Um, talk to us, I guess, a little bit about uh, you played Seattle here and the MLR. What kind of impact can the MLR have on Rugby Canada and helping, I guess, keeping some of our professional players more at home um, as opposed to potentially going overseas? I know overseas it's a strong, stronger leagues, but having them kind of closer to home for training purposes for RC, how can that help? Uh, the, the biggest thing let's just take Toronto because there's only one team and there's going to be one team. I, I don't think Canada's getting another team anytime soon. Um, that core group playing together all the time. Continuity is, is number one factor on being successful. Um, there's a reason why you sometimes see teams with five and six national guys on one professional team in England, France, and continuity is huge. And, and that's my one big belief that'll help it. And now, you know, getting more players opportunity to play professionally and train professionally supports that. So Seattle has a number of Canadians, Atlanta does. And, you know, you're going to see San Diego and a few other teams have a few more Canadians going over the time. I think that's the biggest. Um, and then the inclusion of professional rugby has a, it's something the kids can look up to. It's hard to go, oh yeah, like, Stomp Francais or, you know, you know, the Chiefs. Oh, they play at two in the morning. Like, time frames of, of when games are played, it's on TV, it's on social media. There's connection between the players that they're looking up. There's a pathway. It all kind of has an intermingling part that works. So I think it's a three-part question. I think it's going to be a – there's a huge opportunity for rugby in, in rugby in Canada and rugby Canada. And, and it starts with that. Um, I, I do believe we need another team. Yeah. Um, but Seattle being so close, kind of like a, a really good blessing because it's, it's that close for where Vancouver people can look at it and can watch it and, and, and feel it. So um, I hope Vancouver gets a team because that's the only other market right now. I'll just see it out east in Halifax. There's a I, Halifax. I agree. I love I, I love the grounds. I love the place. I I just don't know how. Um, and that's more of my ignorance on how the business aspect works. Yeah. I mean, we were in twenty was it twenty eighteen, I think when I was coaching the provincial. we had my my under eighteen team there. We watched you guys play the US and the Wanderers grounds are beautiful. But I, I could almost guarantee that if you had that stadium set where you have 7,000 that would fill every, every game. Um, you'd, be, you'd have people driving from PEI and New Brunswick to watch every, every weekend. But the, yeah, the financial business aspect of getting that team to different locales, like I don't know how much money's inv involved in that, but it's, uh, it's more than my teaching salary can afford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a great question. And, and when I look at it, I know the participation from Gate will be huge. Yeah. Because you don't have anything. Like, there's no CFL team. There's there's junior hockey. And then you go down to Boston or you go to Montreal to watch hockey. Yeah. So if they get professional sport and have something to rally on, I mean, I I, I wanted to there. 
and the things logistically access to you know gyms and, and facilities I think won't be an issue um, financially the cost of living there's cheaper yeah. so it, there's benefits fly being on the eastern seaboard that flight isn't that bad to go down to those teams major airport right there yeah it's it's some of it's the um the actual how much growth can there be and i think that's where the business goes is being like okay they want to see this team um get to twenty thousand people is that actually realistic would that mean the franchise is just temporarily there, temporarily there yeah or does it have to go to St. John's? I ain't gonna make it bigger. No, it's a lot, lot harder, a lot more expensive to get up, to get up into Newfoundland. But right. It looks like Hawaii's coming into play and potentially, so that'll be that'll be fun. Maybe. A good question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you talked a little bit before we started recording about your coaching philosophy, and it kind of ties in a little bit with what you think makes a great team player, like skills over 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 uh, character, character over skills. Um, what makes great team players? What's your coaching philosophy when it comes to the aspect of the individual and how they can help a team? Um, so the things I look at, uh, respect. I mean, there's plenty of people um, I played with that I wouldn't call friends or close friends. Um, I, I may be friends, but not close friends. Um, so that respect and, and there's people I don't agree with lots of people and there's lots of people that don't agree with me um but i respect their opinion i respect what they say and i respect um what they've done to get there um that being one of the first things is is i think that's um really important and i say you know the way i i, I was taught the game you respect the game too uh, you respect the referees and you respect everyone around it you have to respect yourself and, and the things you do within it. Um, so that's one of my biggest you know, values within my, my philosophy and the way I look at rugby. Um, it's the tough one because you question honesty. Um, are you honest with yourself and what you're doing? Because it's so you know controversial, what I think's right and what you think's right and who thinks right and who thinks wrong and, and so I just, you know, you hope that you follow those values and honesty is a big one. So when you, when you do make mistakes or when you're asked something that you do them in, a, in that manner, being honest. And then I look at um, integrity. Uh, that's another big one. Um, I mean, I make mistakes and I, I, I try to live by a level of integrity that's, um, that I demonstrate hopefully that it, I mean, I'm trying to achieve it better every day because <laughs> again, I, I've done things that I, I've made mistakes and things that maybe didn't follow that pathway, but I hope to God that I never do them again and making those things um, and, and changing. And I think things like this are all fluid. So growth is, is definitely, if I judge the same person who's 40 uh, to a 20 year old and have those expectations, they're not going to be there. Yeah. So really kind of evaluating it that way, you know, I mean, on experience and growth, I, uh, I got a cap of 32 and a kid who has got to do the same job I had at, at 18, 19, 20. Uh, and I was mature mentally, physically, maybe not even physically, mentally mature, you know, emotionally mature. Those kids are still developing that. So, so it's, it can be a little detailed when it comes to that, but, um, what I look at, at, at players is, is being able to go and try to do as much as you can to improve yourself to help be a, a, a puzzle to the piece that creates success. And success is measured in, in very arbitrary. So it's, it's a holistic way of looking at it, but the character of someone, I think, who plays for Canada and, and, and plays for your team should represent that and and if they're not yeah i can't pick for my team i'll tell you that yeah. um and that's just kind of how i believe the formula towards success i think you need to make winning a skill i get it's hard um 
and there's expectations and and learning how to win is something i learned um in in high school i got to learn in university i got to learn at top club and i got to learn it professionally and i got to learn it nope I, I didn't learn it really that well internationally so i was constantly trying to learn how to win internationally because i wasn't pleased so you know i mean it it's the one for me blemish is that I wasn't as successful on the on the on the wins and losses, and you sometimes take, that's how you're measured. You take those you take those losses and those lumps, but you learn from them as well. Um, our philosophy on the winning is a little bit different. Mine is uh, because I coach high school. It's you know winning doesn't matter unless you get paid. And for me, when I teach my kids, it's about how to learn from those losses to improve. And as long as you're giving 100 percent for you and your teammates every day, the wins will eventually come. And, but you can't judge yourself. What I tell the kids, you can't judge yourself on the wins and losses because somebody always has to lose. And if you go 0-12 through a season, does that mean that you're losers? To me, it's it, as long as you're making those steps forward, you're not a loser. You're, you're actually becoming better. But Yeah, I agree 100%. You know, I speak on probably that, that top tier a little too much. And that's what I mean by it being fluid is that, you know, when I speak about high school, like, I mean, like, I want to win every game. Yeah. But I don't look at it as a disappointment if we lose. Uh, there's a little bit of disappointment because, again, you, that's, you, you're you trying to win. But yeah. at the end of it, like, I look at success as, is kids still playing the game? Are they involved? Are they donating? Are they coaching? Are they being physios? Are they running the club? Are they picking up parents and or picking up kids to drive yeah. the games? That's all success. That's all measurable. They're, they're – that part of being part of rugby is is how huge. I measure it, um, especially when I look at high school and that age of an athlete. Um, there's coaches here who only give a shit about the banner and winning, and then there's their bosses who only give a shit about that. Yeah, I, I I tell you what, they're important, but they're not that important. Yeah. Um, and then you'll get a kid who does play for the province and you'll get one kid every five years who might make an age grade team. And you might get a kid from your club that does make international and that's once every 15, 10 years. Yeah. So measure, they're just, there's different things to measure by. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we sign off, Ray, uh, I, I got to hear the roadkill story. The roadkill story. So, the roadkill story is uh, a guy I uh, was part of my club, and, and you know <laughs> we have uh, we have our own club, and we're out in the out in the you know rural area. So once a year, you know when you have those triple headers, you know our club had men's and seconds and first, and, and, and our ladies team. We did really work hard to aligning that that camp out weekend when we all had three games, so that. We all can hang out, watch the games, have huge barbecue, invite the team that's playing to stay over. Everyone puts tents on the field and we just get on the piss and have fun, typical club stuff, enjoyment. <laughs> Big bonfire. We're right by the Lake Erie and, and the quarry, so they're swimming and, and you know, taking on. But what ended up happening this year, the one year that I think it was canal days and um, obviously the Welland Canal where that lovely, you know, <laughs> boat ran into another boat this week um which is mind-boggling um that's right down the way Jeez. Um, where that happened so uh there's a big celebration about the canal being put through between the two lakes and, and so they make an event out of it and there's one with can-am and there's always these you know summer holidays so we would go down there and everyone have fun there's live music and drinking and then some people will come back and maybe get food and, and really kick off the night part but one person just didn't make it back. And then the next morning, people are coming back from their homes or wherever they fell over and, and are getting rides back into the club to kick their vehicles or whatever. And young man's on the road. And um, he's uh, inebriated and I think buck naked or potentially <laughs> buck naked or, or shirt off or something. And so this story is... Um, he looked like a piece of roadkill and there's, you know, stuff all over him, stuck to him and, and someone tried to pick him up and he was trying to make it back to the club. So 
someone nearly ran over this guy on the side of the road who passed out in the ditch who looked like a piece of roadkill if you know what it's like when you're out in the rural area there's lots of roadkill and, uh, and raccoons everywhere raccoons and i mean deer and uh, yeah. most, most of the time they get picked up but um you know they he looked like roadkill and 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 that was 20 years ago and that name stuck so who are you going to tell us who who it was no <laughs> Do that. <laughs> All right, that was a, that's a great story to end on, right? I uh, just want to thanks for having you. Uh, huge thanks for coming on the Canadian Rock. It was great listening to your stories and coaching philosophy, and uh, wish you well out west. And uh, for our listeners, Ray's uh, he's currently doing his masters in coaching right now in, uh, in in British Columbia. So we wish you the best of luck finishing up your courses. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't see the tweet out earlier, but. Um, I, like I said, I've been flat out, but uh, I appreciate the call and uh, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Uh, a lot different from any other podcasts and uh, I like your approach better, to be honest. Uh, so um, a little bit of kudos for, to you. Appreciate it. Cheers, Ray. Cheers. Oh, I love that. Roadkill. What a great nickname. What a great story to get a rugby nickname. Anyway, uh, thanks very much, Ray. That was a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, wish you nothing but the best, uh, pursuing your masters in coaching. That'll be, uh, that'll be a great, uh, feather in your cap. It'll be also be amazing for those young athletes that you get to, uh, you get to look after and get to coach. Um, looking to get Ray back on again to do a round table with some of his old mates from, uh, uh, from, from his playing days. And, uh, hopefully that we can get that set up soon. Coming up next, we have Nadia Popov. She's going to talk to us about rugby and mental health. Uh, we have Mark Wyatt coming up. Mark was famous uh, in the 80s and 90s for his dominance with Canada um, at the, you know, 87 World Cup, the 91 World Cup, and uh, a lot of international matches. Uh, we'll be chatting with Brett Bukaboom soon. Brett, uh, Brett's retired now, but uh, he's an outstanding player for Canada for a number of years. And we have long-standing uh, front rower Hubert Bidens is going to be joining us as well. And as well, we're going to have Rod Snow on. Rod's another member of those late 80s, early 90s uh, Rugby Canada teams, and he'll be joining us soon as well. Uh, lastly, uh, but not least, always a thank you to those essential workers. Schools are getting ramped up. Uh, make sure that you're uh, taking precautions as best you can while you're out and about, whether that's in the classroom getting geared up, whether that's, you know, a trip to Costco, whether that's what have you, but just making sure that you're still staying safe because there is still a global pandemic going on. Uh, thoughts and prayers going to uh, everybody in uh, Beirut, Lebanon there. Uh, from that massive explosion a few days ago that was just gut-wrenching to see and uh, we, we pray and uh, hope uh, for everything to turn out as best as possible for those families and those individuals involved uh, i'd like to say thanks to ben sound music for supplying us with our tunes and as always never hesitate to reach out uh, you know and feel free to always send me a direct message on instagram or email me or what have you if you have a request for topics or uh for for guests or questions that you would like me to ask people that you know are coming up uh never hesitate always always feel free to reach out so until next time this is jamie stay safe stay healthy stay sane most importantly keep on rocking <laughs>